Welcome back to another chapter of Oh God, Not Malfoy. Chapter 5 The pale morning light seeped through the narrow windows of the Slytherin dormitory, casting a cold grey hue over the room. Harry awoke with a jolt, disoriented for a moment by the unfamiliar canopy of emerald green velvet above him. The events of the previous night flooded back, the duel with Draco still trapped in Harry's body, the spells that ricocheted off the tiled walls of Moaning Myrtle's bathroom, and the unsettling realisation that Draco had given Tom Riddle's diary to someone. So who did he give it to? Harry pondered, sitting up in the plush four-poster bed. The diary was a horcrux, containing a fragment of Voldemort's soul. If it was already influencing someone, the consequences could be catastrophic. It couldn't be Ginny since she wasn't at Hogwarts yet, so someone else entirely. The thought sent a chill down his spine. He needed to find out who had the diary and put a stop to it before it was too late. He dressed quickly, fastening the silver and green tie of Slytherin House with a grimace. The weight of Draco's body felt alien, and the coldness of the dungeon only heightened his sense of unease. As he made his way to the common room, he was met by Crab and Goyle, who were stuffing pastries into their mouths. Morning, Draco, Goyle mumbled through a mouthful of food. Ready for the Halloween feast tonight? Crab asked, crumbs tumbling down his robe. Can't wait, Harry replied tersely. His mind was elsewhere, fixated on the significance of the date. Halloween, the night Quirrell had let a troll into the castle as a diversion to try and steal the sorcerer's stone. If tonight follows the same pattern, I might have a chance to stop him. They headed to the Great Hall for breakfast. The enchanted ceiling mirrored the overcast sky outside, and the usual chatter of students filled the room. Harry scanned the Gryffindor table and spotted his own face, Draco, in his body, sitting with Ron and Hermione. Draco's eyes met his, a fierce glare that could have cut stone. Angry red scratches marred his face, evidence of their skirmish. Pansy Parkinson leaned over, noticing the exchange. He looks pretty mad at you, she remarked, smirking. Harry forced a nonchalant shrug. Let him be mad, he said coolly. It's not my problem. But it was his problem. The scratches indicated that Draco hadn't taken their encounter lightly. Harry wondered what Draco's next move would be. I have to act before he does something irreversible. The day passed in a blur of classes and whispered conversations. Harry kept an eye on Draco whenever he could, but the other boy seemed content to stick close to Ron and Hermione, no doubt spinning lies and deepening the rift. As evening approached, the Great Hall was transformed for the Halloween feast. Enormous pumpkins carved into lanterns glowed warmly, and live bats fluttered beneath the enchanted ceiling, which now showed a twilight sky sprinkled with stars. The tables groaned under the weight of sumptuous dishes, roast meats, savoury pies, and desserts of every kind. Harry took his seat between Crab and Goyle at the Slytherin table. His eyes darted to the staff table. Notably, Professor Quirrell's seat was empty. So he's preparing for his grand entrance, Harry thought grimly. What's got you so tense? Pansy asked, eyeing him curiously. Just thinking, Harry replied curtly. Across the hall, Draco caught his eye again, smirking despite the scratches on his face. Harry felt a surge of anger, but tamped it down. Stay focused. The feast began, and Harry picked at his food, too anxious to eat. He kept glancing at the staff table, waiting. Finally, just as the puddings appeared, the doors to the Great Hall burst open. Professor Quirrell staggered in, his turban askew, and a look of terror etched on his face. Troll! In the dungeon! he gasped, clutching his chest dramatically. Thought you ought to know! He then collapsed in a dead faint. Pandemonium erupted. Students screamed and stood up, knocking over goblets and plates. Dumbledore rose to his feet, his voice magically amplified. Silence, he commanded, and the hall fell quiet. Prefects will lead their houses back to the dormitories immediately. As the Slytherin prefects began organising the younger students, Harry seized his moment. He leaned toward Crab and Goyle. Follow me, he whispered urgently. What? We're supposed to go to the common room, Goyle protested. 
You guys want to have some fun. Not scared of old Professor Snape finding out you didn't follow instructions now, are you? Harry asked Dot. They hesitated, but eventually nodded. Their curiosity piqued. Harry led them out of the Great Hall, blending into the mass of students before veering off down a deserted corridor. Where are we going? Crab asked nervously. To the third floor corridor, Harry replied, quickening his pace. Crab and Goyle exchanged worried glances. But that's forbidden? Goyle pointed out. Since when do you care about rules? Harry shot back. Come on. They arrived at the heavy wooden door that led to the forbidden area. It was locked, as expected. Harry drew Draco's wand from his robes. Alohomora, he whispered. The lock clicked open, and the door creaked ajar. Are you sure about this? Crab asked, his voice wavering. Positive, Harry said, pushing the door wider. Unless you guys would rather be good little students and head back to the common room. At they stepped into a dimly lit corridor, the air thick with dust and the scent of old wood. At the end of the hallway stood another door, slightly ajar. A low, rumbling growl emanated from within. What's that sound? Goyle whispered, his eyes wide. Probably just the wind, Harry lied smoothly. He pushed the door open and they stepped inside. The massive form of fluffy, Hagrid's three-headed dog loomed before them, each head resting on massive paws. Crab and Goyle froze in terror. That's a... Crab stammered. A Cerberus, Harry confirmed. Don't worry, he's harmless when he's asleep. Harmless? Goyle echoed incredulously. Quiet, Harry hissed. We don't want to wake him. As they stood in the dimly lit room, the low growls of the slumbering three-headed dog filled the heavy silence. Fluffy's massive chests rose and fell in a rhythmic cadence, each head nestled atop colossal paws. Crab and Goyle exchanged nervous glances, their eyes wide with a mixture of awe and fear. Maybe we should go, Goyle whispered, his voice barely audible over the dog's rumbling snores. Before Harry could respond, he heard the distant echo of footsteps approaching from the corridor beyond. His heart quickened. Someone was coming, and fast. Someone's heading this way, he hissed, motioning for them to be silent. The boys stiffened, their faces paling. Without warning, Harry made a split-second decision. Follow me, he commanded, turning on his heel. Dot. The hinges groaned as he pushed it open, stepping into the corridor just as Professor Quirrell appeared at the far end. Quirrell's eyes widened in surprise, his turban slightly askew as he halted mid-step. Mr. Malfoy? he stammered, his gaze flickering between Harry and the doorway he had just exited. Harry offered a sly grin. Oh, hello, Professor, he drawled, infusing Draco's characteristic sneer into his voice. You've recovered from fainting because of the troll quite quickly, out for an evening stroll, or perhaps looking for something? Quirrell's fingers twitched at his sides. I, I was just ensuring all students are safe in their common rooms, he replied hurriedly, avoiding direct eye contact. It's dangerous to be out tonight. Behind Harry, Crab and Goyle shuffled out of the room, the door clicking shut behind them. They eyed Quirrell warily, their earlier bravado thoroughly diminished. Really? Harry said, arching an eyebrow. Not searching for a certain shiny stone someone might have hidden under that big old dog back there? He tilted his head slightly, watching for a reaction. Quirrell's face blanched, and for a fleeting moment, a flash of something dark flickered in his eyes. The corridor seemed to grow colder. From somewhere impossibly close, a sinister whisper hissed. He knows. The boy knows. Harry's blood turned to ice. The voice hadn't come from Quirrell's lips, but seemed to emanate from the very air itself, or perhaps the back of his turban. Quirrell's demeanor shifted abruptly. His trembling ceased, replaced by a sudden, unsettling stillness. You should not meddle in affairs that do not concern you he said quietly, his voice devoid of its usual stutter. In a swift motion, Quirrell drew his wand, a glint of determination in his eyes. Stupefy! He shouted, the spell hurtling toward Harry with blinding speed. 
Instinct took over. Harry dove to the side, the red beam narrowly missing him. Time seemed to slow as he watched the spell soar past and strike Crab squarely in the chest. As the crimson beam of Quirrell's spell streaked past him, its heat singeing the air, Harry, in Draco's body, threw himself to the cold stone floor. The spell exploded against the wall behind him, showering him with fragments of ancient mortar and sending a resonating boom echoing down the dimly lit corridor. The flickering torches cast chaotic shadows, their light dancing wildly as if in response to the sudden surge of dark magic. Heart hammering against his ribs, Harry scrambled to his feet, his palms scraped and stinging. The corridor seemed to close in around him, the walls narrowing as tension thickened the air. Nearby, Goyle was hunched over Crab, who lay sprawled and motionless on the flagstones, his usually ruddy face drained of colour. The sight of Crab's slack expression and closed eyes sent a jolt of fear through Harry. This was no schoolyard jinx. Professor Quirrell, what are you doing? Harry shouted, his voice echoing off the stone with a mixture of shock and defiance. He clenched his fists, acutely aware of the absence of a wand, and took a cautious step backward. Quirrell turned to face him fully, and in the unsteady torchlight, his features appeared sharper, almost predatory. Gone was the meek, stuttering professor. In his place stood a man radiating cold confidence. His eyes gleamed with a malevolent fire, reflecting the flicker of the flames as a sinister smile curved his lips. Ah, Mr. Malfoy. Quirrell purred, his voice silky and free of any tremor. Curiosity can be so perilous. Each word dripped with contempt, and the absence of his usual stutter sent a chill down Harry's spine. Before Harry could react, a soft rustle drew his attention to the shadows at the end of the corridor. From the darkness emerged Severus Snape, his black robes flowing behind him like liquid night. His obsidian eyes flickered with unreadable intent as they swept over the scene. The fallen crab, the trembling goyle, Harry's tense stance, and the transformed demeanour of Quirrell. Explain yourselves, Snape demanded, his voice cutting through the silence like a blade. The air seemed to still, the very castle holding its breath. Quirrell's smile widened, taking on a twisted edge. Severus! he greeted, his tone mocking yet laced with something darker. Slowly, almost theatrically, he raised a hand to his turban, just attending to some unexpected obstacles. Snape's eyes narrowed, suspicion clouding his gaze. Obstacles, he repeated coldly. What kind of obstacles require attacking students? With deliberate, almost hypnotic movements, Quirrell began to unwind his turban. Layer after layer of rich purple fabric fell away, unfurling like a serpent shedding its skin. Harry felt his breath catch, a primal sense of dread coiling in his stomach. The final fold dropped, and gasps echoed through the corridor. Where the back of Quirrell's head should have been, there was a face, pale as death, with skin stretched taut over sharp bones. Slitted nostrils flared above a thin, lipless mouth, and eyes like burning coals bore into them with an intensity that seemed to pierce the soul. Master, Snape whispered, his usual composure faltering. A myriad of emotions flashed across his face, shock, fear, and something else that Harry couldn't quite place. Severus! Voldemort's voice emanated from the grotesque visage, a hissing whisper that resonated with dark power. I have returned as I always promised I would. Snape took a hesitant step forward, his wand clutched tightly in his hand. How is this possible? he asked, his voice barely more than a breath. I was not aware. Voldemort's mouth twisted into a cruel approximation of a smile. There are many things you are not aware of, he replied smoothly, but that is of no consequence now. The Sorcerer's Stone lies within this castle, and I require your assistance to obtain it. Harry watched the exchange, his mind racing. Snape's allegiance hung in the balance, and the weight of the moment pressed down on him like a physical force. My lord, Snape began carefully, his eyes flickering toward Harry and the unconscious crab. These students are insignificant, Voldemort snapped, a sharp edge to his voice. Dispose of them. Prove your loyalty to me. 
an oppressive silence settled over the corridor. The flickering torchlight cast long shadows across Snape's face, highlighting the tension etched into his features. His gaze locked onto Harry's for the briefest of moments, and in those dark eyes, Harry thought he saw a flicker of inner turmoil. Suddenly, the distant sound of hurried footsteps broke the stalemate. The soft rustle of robes and the clinking of magical paraphernalia grew louder, signalling the approach of others. Voldemort's eyes narrowed, his expression twisting into one of fury. Time grows short, Severus, he hissed. Do not fail me. Professor Dumbledore appeared at the end of the corridor, his silver beard gleaming in the torchlight. His presence seemed to fill the space with a calming aura, yet his eyes were sharp, taking in every detail. Behind him, Professor McGonagall and Professor Flitwick emerged, their wands drawn and expressions resolute. Severus, Dumbledore spoke, his voice steady but laden with unspoken questions. What is the meaning of this? Snape straightened, his face smoothing into an unreadable mask. For a heartbeat, he remained motionless. Then, with a swift, decisive movement, he raised his wand. Expelliarmus! he shouted, the spell aimed directly at Quirrell. Caught off guard, Quirrell staggered as his wand flew from his grasp, clattering across the stone floor. Voldemort's visage contorted with rage. Traitor! Voldemort screamed, the word echoing unnaturally. A surge of dark energy rippled through the air, causing the torches to flare and the very walls to tremble. Snape stood his ground, his wand steady. Petrificus Totalus, he commanded. Bands of shimmering light shot forth, wrapping around Quirrell like spectral chains. The professor's body snapped rigid, his limbs locking into place as he toppled backward, the thud of his fall reverberating through the corridor. For a moment, no one moved. The only sound was the ragged breathing of those present and the distant howling of the wind outside the castle walls. Dumbledore stepped forward, his eyes sad but resolute as he gazed upon Quirrell's immobilized form. It appears we have much to discuss, he said softly, his voice carrying a weight of sorrow. Professor McGonagall approached Harry, her face pale but composed. Mr. Malfoy, are you injured? she inquired, concern edging her tone. Harry shook his head numbly. I'm fine, he managed to reply, his mind still reeling from the confrontation. Dumbledore turned to Snape, his gaze piercing. Thank you, Severus. Your actions tonight have been illuminating. Snape inclined his head slightly, his expression guarded. I did what was necessary, Headmaster. Behind them, Goyle helped a groggy crab to his feet. The boy blinked dazedly, his eyes struggling to focus. What happened? He murmured. We can address all questions in due time, Dumbledore interjected gently. For now, it would be best if you all return to your dormitories. The hour is late and rest is needed. As Harry guided Crab and Goyle away, he cast one last glance over his shoulder. The sight of Dumbledore and Snape standing over Quirrell's bound form lingered in his mind, a tableau of conflicting loyalties and hidden truths. The corridors felt colder as they made their way back, the silence between the three boys heavy with unspoken fears. Shadows seemed to stretch longer, and every creak of the old castle set their nerves on edge. As they retraced their steps through the quiet corridors of Hogwarts, the chill of the dungeons seemed to seep into their very bones. The torches lining the walls flickered weakly, casting long shadows that danced and twisted, playing tricks on their weary eyes. The usual murmurs and creaks of the ancient castle were amplified in the heavy silence between them, each sound making them start and glance over their shoulders. Crab was the first to break the silence, his voice uncharacteristically small. Do you think? Do you think we're going to get in trouble with Snape for all this? He glanced nervously at Harry, his usually dull eyes now bright with anxiety. My father, he doesn't like it when I misbehave. He can be really angry. Harry looked at Crab, surprised to see genuine fear etched on his round face. For a moment, the hulking figure seemed more like a frightened child than the brutish sidekick he knew. A pang of empathy tugged at Harry's heart. I don't think we'll get in trouble, 
he said reassuringly. Snape saw what happened. He knows we were caught up in something bigger. Goyle nodded slowly, though his brow remained furrowed. Still, I hope he doesn't tell our parents. My mum worries a lot. Eh, hey, uh, Harry offered a faint smile. We'll be fine. Besides, we might have actually helped tonight. Crab looked at him quizzically. Helped? What do you mean? Taking a deep breath, Harry decided to be honest. Well, as honest as he could be under the circumstances. I had a feeling something was going on tonight, he admitted. That's why I wanted to go to the third floor. I thought maybe we could, you know, save the day or something. Goyle's eyes widened. You wanted to be heroes? He sounded both impressed and bewildered. Something like that, Harry replied, shrugging. They walked a few more steps before Crab spoke again, his voice barely above a whisper. Did you see Quirrell's head? There was... a face. Goyle shuddered visibly. Yeah, that was creepy. What do you think that was all about? Harry hesitated. Without Ron and Hermione, he felt an acute loneliness pressing in on him. Perhaps, he thought, confiding in Crab and Goyle might not be the worst idea. They were here, after all, and maybe they could be trusted, at least a little. That was Voldemort, he said quietly, the name hanging heavily in the air. Both boys stopped dead in their tracks. Crab's face went ashen. V. Voldemort, he stammered. But he's... he's gone, isn't he? Harry shook his head. Not completely. He's been trying to come back. Somehow he's been possessing Quirrell. Goyle swallowed hard. How do you know that? Harry paused, choosing his words carefully. I've heard things, he said. My father has connections. I've pieced some of it together. Crab looked down at his feet, his large hands ringing nervously. I don't like this, Draco. If you know who is back... Neither do I, Harry agreed softly. But that's why we need to be careful. And maybe, just maybe, we can do something about it. Goyle glanced at him uncertainly. But what can we do? We're just students. Sometimes it's the small actions that make a big difference, Harry replied, echoing words he himself had once heard. They resumed walking, the weight of the conversation settling over them like a thick fog. The corridor seemed longer than before, each step echoing ominously. Crab broke the silence once more. You know, Draco, you've been different lately. Harry looked at him, his eyebrows raised. Different? How? Goyle nodded in agreement. Yeah, more, I don't know, nicer, I guess. A faint smile tugged at the corner of Harry's mouth. Maybe I've just realised there are more important things than, well, than some of the stuff we used to care about. Crab gave a small, appreciative nod. I think I like this new you. They reached the entrance to the Slytherin common room, the stone wall looming before them. Harry whispered the password, and the wall slid open to reveal the dimly lit room beyond. The emerald green lamps cast a soft glow, and the fireplace crackled invitingly. As they stepped inside, Goyle turned to Harry. So, about everything that happened tonight, do you think we should tell someone else? Harry considered this for a moment. Trust was a fragile thing, but he sensed sincerity in their concern. I think it's best if we keep this between us for now, he said gently. We don't want to cause a panic. Let's just see how things unfold. Crab nodded slowly. Yeah, that makes sense. Goyle stifled a yawn. I'm knackered. This has been one crazy night. Harry managed a tired smile. Agreed. Let's get some rest. We can talk more tomorrow. Good night, Draco, Crab said, a hint of warmth in his voice. Good night, Harry replied. He made his way up to the dormitory, his mind a whirlwind of thoughts. Sliding into the four-poster bed draped with heavy green curtains, he lay back against the pillows. The events of the evening replayed in his mind. The confrontation with Voldemort, the unexpected alliance with Snape, and the newfound camaraderie with Crab and Goyle. Without Ron and Hermione, he had felt adrift, but tonight had shown him that allies could be found in the most unlikely of places. Perhaps he could make a difference here, even in Draco's body. 
The path ahead was uncertain, but for the first time since this ordeal began, he didn't feel entirely alone.